everybody. Happy Friday and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is The Daily Show, where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is your Collider Movie Talk crew. First up, senior producer John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Headquarters here at Burbank, California. Brady throws for four touchdowns. How do you like them apples, Roger? <laughs> Also here from Nerdist, it's Miss Clark Wolf. Hey guys, thanks so much for having me. And hey, listen, speaking of which, from Nerdist, you guys at Nerdist have something kind of cool coming up in association with Fathom. What's going on? Yes, it's super, super exciting. So Nerdist is uh, releasing a horror movie. Nerdist Presents The Hive is having its premiere screenings through Fathom events on Monday, this coming Monday across the U.S. It's really exciting. It's the first time that we've uh, released a movie, and uh, I've seen the movie. It's crazy. It's a midnight movie, and it's going to be perfect to kick off Halloween. So uh, if you are interested, oh, and we're also having kind of like like the unofficial premiere at our old haunts at the AMC Burbank 16. Very cool. Which is very exciting. So uh, for all you horror fans out there, check it out, Fathom Events. Uh, Nerdist presents The Hive. And also here, Mr. Christian Harloff. I actually got to just interview Dave Yarvo, who directed the film, which is a lot, and it is a very interesting film. So I'm glad that you guys are uh, are doing that. It's really interesting that Nerdist got involved, and it looks pretty cool. So, hi, I'm Christian Harloff. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, hey, listen, one other thing, guys, we mentioned this on the show a couple times, but I'm going to remind you: if you are interested, and who isn't interested in going to the New York City Comic Con, which is coming up very rapidly, you need to head on over to Collider.com. We're going to put a link in the description of this video to where you can go we've got a giveaway going on where you would win airfare to new york your comic con passes hotel fare spending cash money it's an incredible package look in the description of this video for the link to where you can get all the contest details and how you can end up in new york all right let's get going well, this is huge news. <laughs> Get it? Get it? <laughs> Deadline is reporting that Legendary Pictures has just taken their upcoming film, Kong Skull Island, out of Universal Studios and over to Warner Brothers. The outlet claims that the reason for the move is that Legendary wants to have King Kong and Godzilla under the same studio to open the way for a future King Kong versus Godzilla movie. The move to Warner Brothers won't change Kong's release date of March 10th, 2017 with a sequel to Gareth Edwards' Godzilla planned for June 8th of 2018. John, what do you think of this move by Legendary, and are we actually going to see a Kong versus Godzilla film? I, ha With the move to Warner Brothers, I have no doubt at some point we're going to see a Kong versus Godzilla film. Now, there's a few things that are going to have to happen to make that really possible, and I'm sure we'll get to that in just a, in just a little bit. It's a very interesting move. It's very good for Warner Brothers to pick this up, which I think is great. But this is surprising. Comic-Con was not that long ago. And Universal was touting, you know, their upcoming Skull Island movie, you know, with their stuff. And now it's gone. All I can think about, and I shouldn't just be thinking about this, but this is all I'm thinking about. Think of this in sports terminology. Imagine you heard that the Cleveland Cavaliers just traded LeBron James to the L.A. Lakers or something. Okay, that, that's great for L.A. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. But... You're, the next question you're asking, what the hell did they get? What did they get to give up LeBron James? I am wondering, what the hell did Universal get? Because you know Universal didn't just go, you know what, a King Kong versus Godzilla sounds like a good day. You just take King Kong, because that sounds great. No way. No way in hell that happened. I, I, I'm, I made a couple of calls this morning. I haven't heard anything back. I am dying to know, because that's the other half of this story to me. What did this involve? Now, King Kong is a property at Universal Studios, so maybe there's some extra cheese being given over there for the rights to the for, for the park rights. Maybe Warner Brothers is going to have to give up a property of their own to Universal. Maybe it's like for future considerations. I don't know, but that's the part of this story I am incredibly intrigued about. Anyway, Clark, you heard about this. Your reaction to it? Yeah, I mean, I think that this makes pretty good sense. I think shared universes are, are very popular among studios mm -hmm. right now. They're all trying to get into that game. Um, for me, though, you know, and, and I, I think every point that you just raised is, is really smart, and I'm curious to figure those things out. The thing that jumped out to me first was um, the Godzilla movie that just came out last summer tonally felt very serious to me. It was oh, a yeah. very serious Godzilla movie. And when I think of King Kong versus Godzilla, 
serious is not the thing that sort of jumps <laughs> to my mind. I want to see King Kong versus Godzilla. My favorite scene in Peter Jackson's King Kong movie was when Kong battled the dinosaurs. Oh, it was and, a great oh, it's scene. It's so awesome and badass and great. And so I want to see more of that. But I think that the King Kong franchise, as Peter Jackson introduced it, was much more playful and fun and had kind of a B-movie spirit. Whereas this Godzilla movie... The, none of those things, I think, apply. So what I'm curious about is how tonally you fit this King Kong and this Godzilla in the same world and have it still be a good time. Christian? It's an interesting deal, for sure, because you're right. Uh, what it makes me think of is, is the Spider-Man thing with Marvel because Sony was in trouble with that property. Yeah, Universal was not in trouble, not only with their property. With they had, anything. They had yeah. $3 billion movies this year. So it is a it is a matter of yeah we'll make a nice deal with you guys because this is going to benefit us this way. Now the other thing is too, you also remember the legendary has a hold of these properties. So legendary used to be at Warner Brothers. So they have a they probably have a pretty nice relationship over there too. Can make some nice deals and and mm -hmm. you can see see how that can. I'm sure with the theme parks and everything else, it all plays in. But it also gets me hopeful. Maybe some other franchises down the line can tie in if they have these kind of relationships. It's what we always kind of hoped with. Well, what happens if if the X Men were able to go because of maybe Fox, but Fox doesn't have this kind of relationship that Universal and Warner Brothers does. So. Who knows? I, I like it. I think it's smart. I think it's nice for the fans. I think it's a nice move by the studios because if they both looked, this is a business. So if they both looked and Universal said, okay, this all works for us, and even though we might not benefit from the box office this way, we're going to benefit financially this way, then they're going to sign it over, and there goes Kong to Warner Brothers. Now, I just want to see, like Clark said, how are we going to make it work? We have to see. Because my thing is I actually like the last 10 or 15 minutes of Godzilla's movie because of the Examples that Clark gave. We saw Godzilla fight. We saw him rip faces off. It was, just, so it was awesome. great. That, that, that one shot when he pulls yeah. the thing's mouth and then does his nuclear fire. Yes, down. I was and, like, awesome. and everybody in the theater, I was, I was loved cheering it. at that. And, and it was a matter. And I know. And some people, my, the comment that I got the most that I couldn't stand was, "Well, it was kind of like Jaws, to where they built it up and built no. it up." And then, yeah, but it wasn't because Jaws had a very different story with very compelling actors the whole way through and characters you cared about the whole time. So by the time you got to Jaws himself, it was terrifying. Godzilla didn't need to be that. Godzilla Godzilla was the star of the movie. Brody was the star of Jars, uh, Jars, Jaws. Um, so anyway, um, I want to see exactly what Clark said. What's the tone? And they got to make Kong way bigger if they're going to stick with. Well, the, we were that talking about that, that pre-show because, like, Kong, the way he's traditionally existed, mm -hmm. and uh, under this is not going to be a sequel to Peter Jackson's Kong. I understand, so it's a different Kong, but. The Kong that we've always got, including the one in Peter Jackson, he would roughly come up to Godzilla's knee mm -hmm. yeah. in the way they scale Godzilla. So you're this gonna, Godzilla would eat him. Like yeah, it would bite. literally one pick bite. him up and eat him maybe in two bites. Maybe, two. <laughs> maybe in two maybe bites. Two. So you either you've got to retcon a couple things. Either you got to adjust God's or King Kong way up, or you got to bring God's shrink Godzilla about mm -hmm. half. Or more, or, or a medium in between the two. I gotta figure. Maybe King Kong can team up with the Cloverfield monster, and they can take on <laughs> Godzilla together. Well, is it gonna be a Batman v Superman type scenario too? Because oh, you have to think it would be. be. Yeah, meaning that like, because Kong and Godzilla are both, we both root for them. We root for them. So is it gonna be they're gonna kick the crap out of each other in the beginning, and then you know, then we get some new monsters and they have to team up together, like that type of. Thing. I want to see them doing high five. <laughs> right, Do you remember right. that one Godzilla? Was it Godzilla and Mega Man? Or something like that, where it's the giant robot dude, and they had to tag team this other giant monster, and they were like high fiving oh, each other, great. and it's like, dude. But the other thing, the elephant in the room too on this is there is another giant monster, giant thing property over at Warner Brothers, and that's Pacific Rim. Mm. So that's the other thing that comes up because right. there have been a lot of whispers. I'm not going to say rumors, but there have been a lot of whispers that you know, who knows? Maybe Warner Brothers has plans for Godzilla and Pacific Rim. Mm. If they are trying to bring up what you're suggesting, like a shared cinematic universe kind of thing, maybe the the third in this gigantic threesome yeah. would be Pacific Rim. Didn't Legendary start with Pacific Rim? Didn't they start? Pacific Rim came out before, uh, they left, before right? Godzilla yeah. did. Yeah. yeah, no, I just didn't know if, Le but Legendary was producing on Pacific Rim, no? Yeah. They were, okay. Yeah, that's okay. a Legendary movie, yeah, for okay. sure. Well, by the way, just to interject, even if it's not Pacific, even if it's not Pacific Rim specifically, this has Guillermo del Toro written all over it. Yeah. And, you know, he is very much a friend of Legendary, uh, and I'm a huge fan of his, obviously. But I can, I mean, can I just like put it out into the universe that if a Godzilla versus 
uh, Kong yeah. movie happens. Can Guillermo del Toro please make that movie? That's fun. that's the movie. It's that funny, Michelle, because you could t- I could totally see a Guillermo del Toro. I know he's not, but directing a Kong Skung, a Skull Island movie. Yeah, I couldn't see him doing a Godzilla movie. But you do a Kong versus Godzilla versus Pacific Rim. That oh, yeah. you're absolutely right. That has Guillermo del Toro written all over. Yeah, yeah. Let's make it happen, Internet. <laughs> Let's use our powers for good and not evil for one. All right, what's next? In a recent interview with the Daily Beast, Batman v Superman director Zack Snyder confirmed that more screen time in the new movie will be given to Batman over Superman. Snyder said the following, only in that because it's a different Batman than the Batman that was in the Chris Nolan movies, so we have a little bit more explaining to do. And you just had a whole Superman movie. But I think only in that way because you need to understand where Batman is with everything. And that's more toward the beginning, but it evens back out as it goes on. Christian, what do you make of Snyder comments. It's exactly what we had said when this question was brought up about a month ago. I think it was myself, you, and Schnepp. Yeah. And we said it make you have to do it this way because Chris Nolan's Batman was the last version of Batman that you know in your head. You think Bale. You think, where is he? You, think, yeah. you need to establish who Batman is in this world, especially like he says, in the beginning, to know that's who this new character is. And it also goes back to the fact that we all know this is not a Man of Steel sequel. Mm-hmm. It's not. It's a stand. It's a different. I mean, it's not stand. It's a different movie. Just introducing Batman and Superman happens to be in it. It's. It's just another one of. The, it's a. It is. It's a standalone film in the DC universe. Right. We're going to get a Man of Steel sequel down the line. We're going to get a Batman standalone. But it makes sense to establish who Batman is in this world. And he and, and and like we said, and like Zack Snyder said, we've had Superman. We know who Superman is. We know where he comes from. So we're already we're already familiar with Henry Cavill's version of it. it makes sense. Yeah, I mean. One of the things you have to do in this movie is you have to at least dedicate a little bit of time to sev- severing that connection between our understanding of Batman and the Christopher Nolan Batman. You know, the mm-hmm. swear to me, uh, <laughs> truffle butter, whatever, <laughs> or whatever it is he says. It, it's She's blushing. You okay? <laughs> anyway, the... And so, look, if you're going to have a Batman v Superman movie in a cinematic universe where we've already had an entire Man of Steel movie, then if you're going to have equal balance between Batman and Superman, now follow me here because this sounds like it's contradictory, but it's not. If you're going to have a movie that gives equal balance to Batman and Superman, you have to give more time to Batman. To get it to the point where you can be equal, you have to give more to Batman because we got to get introduced to this character. We got to understand what his deal is. We got to understand why this dude is going after Superman in the first place. To do that, you're going to have to sway easy. And you know what Zack Snyder said is exactly what we said earlier. It's this is what you and I, Shep, said. It's probably going to be more Batman heavy at the beginning, but then as the movie goes on, you're going to see it gets balanced out. That's exactly what Snyder's saying. So this makes total sense to me, Clark. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I agree. And by the way, commenters, get ready. We're going to talk about. About Man of Steel and <laughs> Zack Snyder. Uh, no, but I think what he's saying makes perfect sense from a storytelling from a storytelling perspective. I- exactly what you guys just said. You know, we have to introduce the audience. It's easy for us to forget as fans because the Nolan movies are so ingrained in our brains. We've only had one movie from Zack Snyder's DC Cinematic Universe. So we do have a bit of world building to do. And I think um, this Batman that we're seeing is is a different Batman than than in terms of like where he is in his life and all of those things than the uh, Chris Nolan Batmans. I also would guess, and this is just, I'd be curious to see what you guys think. You know, I think that Based on Zack Snyder's sensibilities and and uh, and his and his um, you know the way he is as a director and all of those things, he might enjoy playing in the Batman sandbox a little bit more than playing in the Superman sandbox. And so it doesn't surprise me that in this movie, I, I frankly I feel like this. DC Cinematic Universe has just been itching to get to Batman anyway. But that's yeah. just my opinion. I mean, but like, yeah, so I think everything he's saying logically makes sense, but also in terms of what he probably wants to pay more attention to as a director, it probably is Batman. And, and why wouldn't you at this point to where, and this again, I think we brought this up last time, was that you're working with Ben Affleck, who is one of the best directors in Hollywood right now. Yeah. Um, so if, if, and who's going to, we all kind of know it, it's been speculated, he's going to direct a standalone Batman film we know he will. Uh, and so this is Ben Affleck also getting used to this character for the first time and and knowing what he's going to do with this character eventually and collaborating with mm-hmm. Snyder too. So it would make sense that they're both kind of collaborating together. Snyder was on his own 
last time. The whole way. He's not on his own. He's not. He's co-directing the Batman stuff with Affleck. He is. I mean, even oh, no doubt. It absolutely is. As far just just in in what the character is doing and what the I'm not talking about shots and that kind of stuff. You know, I'm sure Affleck has his his input on it, but as uh, more of who Batman is this time around, he's sharing it with one of the great directors right now. And I have no problem saying that Affleck's a great director. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, it makes sense. It, it, I've always wondered, this is a, not to the same degree, but I've always wondered in some of his latter movies, thinking about what, what must it be like for you as a director directing a film that Clint Eastwood is starring in knowing that he's a better director than you are. Right, right. <laughs> you are now directing him. Right. So I can't help but wonder if there's a little bit of that going on too. But you know, from all accounts, Zack Snyder's always been very collaborative. So I think he was excited to have Ben Affleck involved here. I, I think I think this is shaping up really nice. Me too. All right, folks, we reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, sinead has got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So Sinead, what do we got? As many of you know, the third film in the Divergent series hits theaters on March 18th, 2016, but it appears it will come with a different name than expected. Lionsgate has announced that they are changing the name for the final two parts of the Divergent series franchise, which were previously known as the Divergent series Allegiant Part 1 and Part 2. The third film will now simply be called the Divergent series Allegiant, while the final film is now called the Divergent series Ascendant. Ascendant, the fourth film, is currently scheduled to hit theaters March 24th, 2017. Clark, do you buy or sell the name change for the Divergent series? Yeah, I buy it. I definitely buy it. I think that, um, you know, for me personally, I, I don't usually, uh, the part ones and the part twos and all the parts, I, you know, it is what it is. I like this. It's a little bit more creative and it might signify too that the movies will sort of stand on their own a little bit more as opposed to, you know, supposed to being one cohesive, uh, you know, long story. So I buy it. You know, I... I thought a party was going to break out in here today. Whenever any Divergent news comes out, Dennis Zen oh, comes into it. studio, yeah. half drunk already, Fanboy. going, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. like he's like yeah. so psyched yeah. about everything. <laughs> hey, Dennis. All right, so. He cut his hair just like Shaylin, uh, what's her face? Yeah, like Shaylin yeah. Woodley. Yeah. He got the, it's, it's kind of embarrassing. That's why he actually. was late. That's he why was... he doesn't come on camera as much anymore. He's, he's, he's <laughs> likes to rock the Shaylin right. Woodley haircut. But honestly, I buy this move. It's the right move. I am so tired because what? Like, wait a minute. So this is the Divergent Series Part 3, Part 1, and the Divergent Series Part 3, Part 2? I mean, I, they've done it before in other movies as well. I like. I think this makes more sense. These aren't the books. These are the movies. They, they may be based on the books, but they're movies. Give them their own titles, a little bit of individuality. I like it. It'll make it easier. Now, whether regardless of what you think of the movie, I think you got to understand this makes sense. So for me, it's a buy. I just buy it slightly because I, it depends on what the parts look like. Like I wouldn't want Mockingjay Part 1 and Part 2 for Hunger Games to be called anything differently because those movies clearly end. When Mockingjay Part 1 ends, it ends as if Part 2 is coming pretty soon. It's not... It, when you put Mockingjay 1 and 2 together, that is one full movie. That's Mockingjay. Same way like Kill Bill Volume 1, Volume 2. That's one full movie. I don't know these books. I, I, so I can't really speak on it. So if, if, if I'm watching the movie and by the end of it, you know, what's Allegiant? If, if by the end of that I'm going, oh, that's clearly a Part 1, then I'm going to think it's silly. They should have just said Part 2. Um, but I don't care enough to really make that much of a fight because it's like I don't understand what's hap happening with a lot of the Fleeby Flobbit and the Who's He Was It's there's so many things happening in this story that the names are so confusing like you know it's like I, I it's, you whatever. pronounce them shockingly well they're good yeah. right the yeah. you really nailed it for Who's somebody who doesn't know the franchise <laughs> sure, I know I know so uh, but you know, the, the last one was just so bad that you can call it you know don't watch this movie and that's what it should be called <laughs> part one and part two <laughs> part one yeah. don't part watch two. this movie part, part one watch. <laughs> don't part two watch is part this two. movie <laughs> All right, what's next? Director Kevin Smith has announced that a sequel to his 1995 comedy Mallrats will begin production in January and will shoot at the Exton Square Mall in Exton, Pennsylvania. Most of the original cast is expected to return for the new film, including Kevin Smith himself and Jason Mewes as Jay and Silent Bob. John, do you buy or sell the upcoming Mallrats 2? Yeah, I buy it. I mean, look, Kevin Smith right now is doing a little bit of what some Hollywood actors like Schwarzenegger and Stallone and Vin Diesel have done, which is let's go back to the stuff that really worked for us before. And in the case of like Vin Diesel and Schwartz, or, uh, Stallone at any rate, it's, it's worked out quite well doing that. Me personally, so I'll buy it. I mean, personally though, I'm really hoping he's still sticking with the plan. What they announced back in April that was that he was aiming to do Mallrats 2 and then do Clerks 3 after that. 
I am far more interested in Clerks 3. I actually think Clerks 2 is an incredibly underrated genius comedy. I think once you get beyond the donkey show jokes and all that kind of stuff, that was a comedy that hit me where I was in my life so well. I mean, there's a depth to that movie that I think a lot of people miss, up, miss out on because of the surface humor to it. And the surface humor is really funny in and of itself. I treasure Clerks too, actually. I think it's a wonderful film. I'm dying to see where he goes with that. But as far as Mallrats go, yeah, this is good. I'm curious to see what they're going to do with this. So for me, it's a buy. Big buy for me. I love Mallrats. It's actually my favorite Kevin Smith movie. Really? The first nice. one is. I love Clerks. I love Clerks. I didn't like Clerks too. I just wasn't. I just it's my favorite Kevin Smith film. Funny, see, I didn't, and, and I love Kevin Smith. I just, uh, and the thing with Kevin Smith, what he's done recently is, and he was smart, is that because he's just, he's like, he's one of us to where, he would be, as far as being in the geek world and and podcasting and being, I mean, he's he's really, he's become almost like a god of the podcasting world. That everything that he's done so far in this world, he's made a voice for him there, uh, for himself there. You know, the comic cons, and so going back, you know, his he hasn't been in the directing spotlight as much. I mean, you hear him, and even the the small movie he did the uh, tusk. the tusk which I thought was bizarre on so many different levels that came from one of his podcasts you know yeah. like so to see him go back like you said like Stallone and and, and Schwarzenegger and all these guys to do one of his properties Mallrats to me is it scares me because I don't want because I love the first one so much I remember seeing it as a kid and just loving it and I still can watch it Steve Dave and the whole crew um, but the the thing is with that movie it says the cast is supposed to come back. You can't do Mallrats two without Jason Lee. No, I think I think he's got. You've got to have yeah, Jason Brody is the best part of that movie. Now I don't know if Michael Rooker's coming back or anything too, but um, I want to see what happened to those characters. It'd be very interesting to me. Uh, if it, but that's what it worries about me with Clerk two, like you said, the donkey jokes and all that stuff. The dialogue stuff in Clerks two was fun and it was good. Well, Smith's strength. Th that right. That was the fun stuff. But it was when he got away from what was so special about Clerks One to me was that it was simple. It was simple. And it's, it's what we were talking about with Shyamalan. When Shyamalan had so much money that he got lost in the money of it. I think because Kevin Smith had a little bit more money to play with, he put that donkey stuff in and put that and you didn't need it. You just Dante and uh, their their voice and the stuff that they said was enough. And that's what I want Mallrats Two to be. Just be simple. Be a day in the mall. I don't need some big action piece to happen and a gun fight to go down. I, all I need is just the dialogue and the silly things happening. Well, that's two and I'm in. Yeah, um, I buy it for you, too. Thank you. <laughs> you, you both are so excited. I, To me, you know, look, Kevin Smith has said over the last... You're right. He's, he's very much in his world. You know, Kevin Smith has built an empire for himself, which he is very much the king of. And, you know, he's very comfortable in that space, in the geek space, in the nerd space, in the con space, in the podcasting space. And he is making movies for his fans and his fans alone. And I think... That's great for his fans. I do think that, you know, while I didn't like Tusk and uh, was not a fan of Red State, for me as a genre fan, I loved seeing the attempt at it. You know, I loved seeing him cross into these waters that were a little different. Takes risks. It, he, yeah. yeah, taking the mm -hmm. risk, exactly. And I would like to see more of that from Kevin Smith, but I think at this point in his career, he's kind of gotten to a place where he's like, well, why would I do that? Why would I? When I can just do something really cool that's cool to me, that's cool to my fans for this small majority or this small group and call it a day. So to me personally, Clark, I'm kind of like, okay, whatever. But for the fans, this is a huge thing. So You know, one of the words that's, one of the cliche words that's way overused and thrown around and misused a lot is brand. Mm -hmm. um, Kevin Smith is one of those few celebrities that has truly turned himself into a brand. Yeah. Absolutely. Kevin Smith is a brand. Even the jersey. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the jersey, the podcasting, the geek circles, yeah. all that yeah. kind of stuff. He's done it very well and done it very successfully. All right, what's next? According to a story in The Hollywood Reporter, Charlie's Angels and Terminator Salvation director McGee has just signed on to direct the upcoming horror comedy The Babysitter. The film is written by Insurgent and Jane Got a Gun screenwriter Brian Duffield and is described as follows. A lonely 12-year-old boy in love with his babysitter discovers some hard truths about life, love, and murder. No <laughs> information regarding possible release dates or production schedules is currently available. Christian, do you buy or sell the sounds of The Babysitter? This goes back to a topic that we've talked about many times is that it all depends on teams and who you have writing it and directing it that a premise could sound interesting because if you put a certain director in, you read that promise that premise to me, I go, yeah, yeah, yeah bye. I got to sell it. Um, I have met Mick G before. He's one of the nicest people you could meet. He's an incredible television producer. 
he is not a good director. <laughs> like in it, most of his stuff that you see, it's just not good. And you can throw Charlie's Angels out there, the first one. The last Terminator was almost crushed the franchise. It threw Christian Bale into a mental rant, rant that we still hear about all the time. Um, <laughs> and and it, it, there's just so much. And that, that movie he did with Tom Hardy and Chris Pine, oof. Uh, it, it's just so much not good with what he does. And so I don't know. There's so much not good. This is so much not good. I just don't know if I care. And then you throw in the screenwriter for Insurgent and Jane Got a Gun, which was supposed to come out like 700 years ago, and it still hasn't come out. Why? You know, that's I'm going to blame somebody, and why as well blame the writer, because now I know who you are. Um, <laughs> but but that's, oh that, that's really all I got. I don't care. You know what? I'm I'm gonna buy it. I I think it's it's an interesting sounding premise. It sounds like a simple uh, approach to this type of a genre, <laughs> the horror comedy thing. It's a tricky one, but if you nail it and you keep it simple, it can be pretty effective on screen. And oddly enough, while I agree with you, for the most part, I've not been a fan of McGee's work. I really do like what he did on the first Charlie's Angels. Right. I will forever be indebted to him for the fact that he was the executive producer and creator of Supernatural, my current favorite film. On Great Earth. producer on television. Uh, show yeah. on TV. He was the creator, executive producer of Chuck. Chuck which he did a great job there as well. I think even though I'm not a big fan of his as a director, because you're right, uh, This Means War Oof. was so seven bad. special flavors of awful. I, I mean, it, it was... Okay, Directed-wise, so, directing-wise. Anyway, um, then uh, you're talking about Terminator and stuff like that. But a film that sounds like this one, The Babysitter... This actually, to me, sounds like it could be an interesting fit. So I'm going to choose to be optimistic, and I'm ever so slightly going to go buy. I'm totally going to buy this <laughs> for a couple of reasons. First of all, I do think that Mick G is a great pop director, right? So you talk about Charlie's Angels. Um, I like the second one, so whatever. But I like both <laughs> both Charlie's Angels movies. And um, Mick G got his start, you know, doing Sugar Ray videos and, and uh, No Doubt videos. You know, he's a very fun pop culture kind of guy. And uh, by the way, a lot of people like We Are Marshall, which yeah, is also Mick G. Yeah, it's not bad. Um, but regardless, I, and I agree with you, Christian, Mick G is one of the nicest men on the planet and he works hard and he loves, he's very enthusiastic about everything that he's doing. Not to say that that a good movie makes, but, you know, he really cares. And I think that a horror comedy, especially focused around a teenager and a babysitter, I think these are elements that very much play to his strengths. When you're dealing with comedy, when you're dealing with, I'm gonna assume because it's a horror comedy, big uh, colorful visuals mm -hmm. and things like that, I think you have a recipe for, you know, things that he's good at. Yeah, Terminator Salvation probably was not in his wheelhouse, right? But, and I'm not to say that, you know, I get when directors want to step outside right. what they're best known for and want to try something different. And by the way, I like This Means War. I don't care what any but of you guys say. But can you say it's a say. good directed movie? I think it's a, I think, you know what I think the problem with This Means War is, honestly, and I really mean this, it was sold as something that it's not. I think if you watch that movie as a bromance action comedy that's goofy and fun, I liked the action sequences. I kind of thought that's what it was sold as. See, yeah. I thought it was yeah. sold as like a romantic, because it came out on Valentine's uh, Day. Right. That's true too. And that's true. And Reese Witherspoon like kind of sells exactly, romantic comedy yep. right. as this romantic comedy where these two guys. And to me, it was about it was about the chemistry between the two of them. They had good chemistry. Meaning, yeah, but yeah. I Pine and Hardy acting. were great. And yeah. so I thought McGee directed their comedy really well. He directed their time. You know, he directed those actors really well. So I will stump for McGee anytime. And uh, and I think that this is a buy. Mm -hmm. All right, folks, listen, it is Friday, which means it's time for us to butcher our box huh. office predictions yet again, uh, where we take all the films that are currently in theater, the films that are opening up this week, and we try to guess what are going to be the top five films at the box office come Monday when we do our box office report. So I will lead it. I'm going to tell you right now, I feel pretty good. Right. I feel pretty good about my predictions this week, so I'm going to lead things off. I'm going to say coming in at number five is going to be Mission Impossible. I think Mission wow. Impossible is going to hold out. It's going to hang in there in the, into a top five position. I think number two, speaking of holding in there, I think A Walk in the Woods. Oh, sorry, number four, A Walk in the Woods is going to come in there with Robert Redford and uh, 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 Jack, uh, I was going to say Jack Nolte. Yeah. Nick Nolte. I think at number three is going to be War Room. I think it's, that's going to hang in there in the top uh, five. At number two, I think it's going to be The Perfect Guy. And I think at number one, probably by a safe margin, is going to be The Visit. Now, I'm, I'm going to say this, though. Another faith-based movie is opening up. 
uh, called uh, uh, 90 Minutes in Heaven. That could be a spoiler. That could be yeah. a bracket, a bracket mm -hmm. buster here, especially it could affect War Room a lot more, maybe drop War Room out of the top five. But once again, my number one is going to be The Visit. Number two is going to be The Perfect Guy. Three, War Room. Four, Walk in the Woods. Five, Mission Impossible. Christian, what do you got? We have a very similar list, just one different. Um, uh, so I'll start, I'll start from one through because until right. my different uh, one I have the visit two perfect guy three war room four walk in the woods all right five 90 minutes in heaven hmm. is the uh, I, I I that's a bold pick but I think that's, I, that's why a, I, th I think that it's it's gonna it's it, because that story was was pretty big I yeah. think that the audience it's got 800 that you were talking theaters. about yesterday I think it's opening up an 800 yeah. theater so it's a significant amount of theaters so that's my pick all right all right and I'm not throwing it this time I really <laughs> tried last time I was here I made a stand against Adam Sandler okay so um, first of all, for those of you guys watching, this will not be in the top five, but Goodnight Mommy, a uh, European uh, slow burn horror movie is coming out this weekend. It is so good. It is so, so good. It's in select theaters, VOD. It won't be in the top five. It doesn't have a big enough release, but definitely worth your while, guys. What's the name of it again? It's called Goodnight Mommy. Good Night and Mommy. it's got great reviews across the board. Um, and if you are into horror, it's a great movie. Okay, so um, my, we're very close. All of us are very close. Um, my number one is also The Visit, uh, which I very much enjoyed. Uh, number two is The Perfect Guy. Number three, War Room. Um, I have basically what I did for three through five, just took one through three from last week, and I popped them right in. So I think number four is going to be Compton. I think Straight Outta Compton might hold out a little bit longer. And then number five, The Walk in the Woods. All right, so I think we all got Visit, Perfect Guy, War Room in our top three, and then we just differ a little bit in the four and five positions. Th War Room, your number three? War Room is my number three. Okay. Yeah. Cool. yeah. All right, so let's see what happens <laughs> come Monday. All right, folks, we reached that part of the show now for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email it on in to collidervideo at gmail.com. We'll see if we can get your question on either this show or on our weekend mailbag shows. Check it out and see if you make it on. So, Sinead, what's in the mailbag today? Steven writes, while the Fantastic Four has bombed in North America, it has so far made over $100 million overseas for a worldwide total of over $150 million and counting. With the production budget at about $120 million, not including marketing, it appears that the film isn't the monetary catastrophe that we anticipated. What do you think the chances are for a sequel at this point? Well, it is the monetary catastrophe that you think it is. It, like, remember, there's a couple of things we have to go over this from once in a while, but it's, it's worth doing. Um, that 150 million dollars it made has made at the international box office far. Remember, it, it, the number varies a little bit, but roughly speaking, one third of that does not go back to the studios. It stays with the movie theaters. So now you're looking at the movie. The studios are seeing the money that's coming in is actually about 100 million. It's coming back. Now, you add on top of that $120 million production budget, minimum $30 million they did on this. They did a pretty serious job trying to market this right. movie. So you could go as high as 40 but for argument's sake, let's just say 30 Okay. So now that brings the expense of putting that movie out there and doing the PNA on it, $150 million. You've got $100 million come back. This is a $50 million loss right now. Now, maybe that'll shrink down to 40 but... This, there is no studio, there is no paradigm, there is no measuring stick where you call this anything other than a financial disaster. Especially in an August summer movie. Especially for a summer movie like this. When, when you just say, oh, how much money you got? Great. Take 50 million out of that and just burn it in a pile. That's what just happened to Fox. Now, as far as the chance of coming back, Fox is still claiming that they have plans to do another Fantastic Four. I no longer believe they're going to stick to that. But as of today, they are sticking by their guns. So if, it, if they do another one, it's going to be out of pure stubbornness. It will not be out of financial wisdom. Um, but we will see what happens. Mark, what do you think is going to happen here? Chris or Christian? Um, uh, I, uh, I think that they will do a sequel because they're going to be stubborn. They do not want... It's so funny because I, I always said before, they're going to do a sequel. And you've said, there's no way this is happening. No, no, no. I said, I, I, what I said was, was there was, there was no way that that, that date. date. They right. wouldn't hit that date. And I, they won't hit that date. And I don't watch, even... Watch. They're, now, just in spite of everybody, they are doing a sequel. Right. And they're going to They gonna already moved it once. They one moved it by like a week. They moved it still week. moved it. I, I don't count that a move. The, well, they move... I'm, I count it. You move down the block. You still move. Um, <laughs> so they... But what I would say is that they're going to still do it. 
because they do not want the rights to go back to Marvel. They don't. That would be a, that would be like a Marvel, <laughs> like Dennis's skit that he did at the very end. Yeah. It's like Marvel the whole time was just organizing this and, and waiting. So they're going to do it. Now, whether or not it's an actual sequel or another reboot, you're going to see another Fantastic Four, and it's going to be by Fox because it's going to be stubborn. This is a loss. This is a big loss. This is the, they needed this property to be something big, to, to hopefully, because there were a lot of rumors that they were going to appear in the X-Men movies and do that. Now, there is still a possibility in order to suck some life out of this thing is that you're going to see the Fantastic Four pop in in an X-Men movie. That's probably the only way. Brand that, new. Yeah, brand new ones or even, I mean, it, it would make sense to put brand new ones in there, similar to what they're doing now with Spider-Man, introducing him into Civil War. And if you did that and you made them cool in, Apocalypse is too late now, but if you let's say you did, if you were able to do it in Apocalypse, um, and there's a great scene to where you had the thing pop in there, and you're like, whoa, it's the best thing I've ever seen. And then you talk, and then you see a little bit more of what they're all about, and you introduce their history in an X-Men movie, and then you you have a shot, but it's a long shot. I think that's the key. I think that's exactly the key is is X-Men. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I Yeah, I think you're right. I think Fox is stubborn. I don't think they're going to give up the rights. I hope to God we don't get another reboot of this. Um, but I think that that's going to be probably their their Hail Mary is, is, mm. is making them cool in X-Men. And if they can do that, then maybe, possibly, perhaps there is hope for this franchise. Uh, if they did it, maybe a little lower budget. If they if they kind of went back to the drawing board and thought, okay, how can we how can we do this and do it well? Um, but then again, from everything we've heard, uh, Josh Trank rumors aside, you know, there was a lot of meddling from the studio that might have played a part in the downfall of this last movie. So who knows if they're even capable of going back to the drawing board mm -hmm. and doing it well. But I do think that X Men is going to be there. That's that's their last chance to make it cool. That's also a great point, though. Too, with, let's say you know, with the Trank thing, I think that they are going to make a sequel. They need to go after. You think sequel as uh, opposed to reboot? Whatever it is, a sequel. Okay, reboot, you're going to make another one. Whatever it is, if they make another Fantastic Four movie. They need to go after a power director, someone that can tell the studio, tell them something. Basically, hiring them so they can, basically hiring a director that can tell them to f off. Like they need to hire someone like that because that's what you need. You can't you can't hire the the Josh Tranks and 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 the Gavin Hoods anymore. You, you can't do that anymore. You have to because they can bully them and it's getting out there it got out there on both circumstances get a director that loves the material whether it's a john john favreau type guy or someone along those lines that's going to stick to their guns and make the movie that they want to make no matter what fox does but it, what matthew vaughn did with first class or well, they need, oh i'm sorry well i was just going to say there's really only three names that i think fox right now would do that for i think one is brian singer mm. i think they they trust him enough and they respect him enough and they stay out of his way for the most part i mean they set the, the parameters and the guidelines of what they want brian singer doesn't they trust him i think the other one would be matthew vaughn i think matthew vaughn is a type of guy they would let that go with and then um james cameron i think james cameron's the only other guy that they yeah. work with that they would go he's tied up in blue world he's tied yeah. up in blue but i'm saying but that's a, a name like that yeah. that they other than that there's not a lot of directors that they don't feel they can just push around True. but but one of those three and going back to your talking what the earlier point you guys were making about the x-men stuff well that's what brian singer and matthew vaughn are doing so maybe they are the guys to do it and that's yeah. exactly what i was going to say is they need their brian singer whomever that is right. you know the the x-men franchise i think was successful for a while because of you know the the um groundwork that singer laid and he you know handled it and then vaughn came back and to me, Vaughn's movie is my favorite of all of those. But, um, you know, and then Brian Singer came back again. So, yeah, that's what they need. Fantastic Four needs a Brian Singer, even if it's not Brian Singer. All right. All right last question of the day. James right? Hey, Collider Crew. I was wondering, with Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 opening May 5th, 2017, and Star Wars 8 opening May 26th, 2017, wouldn't Star Wars cannibalize Guardians? Should Guardians move up a week so they are not so close? Thanks, and keep up the great work. Well, this is the thing, though. Once you get into May now, you're into the heart. I mean, this is the, the heavy part of the summer movie season, May and June. Uh, and then you get a few that'll come out in July, August, whatever. But no, if Star Wars wasn't on that date, something else monstrous would be on that date. When you release in summer, you are going to face big competition. But th sometimes the big competition is a blessing because it's bringing more and more people to the Cineplex. And trust me, there's overflow and all this kind of stuff. Three weeks is actually a pretty good distance. If it was one week, scared. Two weeks, nervous. 
three weeks, there will be some effect. There will be some effect. But like I said, if it's not Star Wars, this is another big movie there. You move Guardians back another week, now you're closer to another big property. There is nowhere to go. There's nowhere to hide in the summer. There is nowhere to hide in the summer season anymore. So you're going to be up against something. Is it going to cannibalize it a little bit? Yes. But every other movie out is going to cannibalize it a little bit too. Guardians is going to be able to stand on its own. It's going to do great. Star Wars is going to make huge money. And then people who love Star Wars are going to go see Guardians. And people who love Guardians are going to go see Star Wars. And we're all going to see it seven times. So I think there will be an effect, absolutely. But it won't be that noticeable. Christian. Here's the difference with your point, though, is that you're right. There will be another movie there regardless, but it won't necessarily be by the same studio. That's what I was going to th- say. That is going to... But all- doesn't that play in the favor? I'm saying it's good, like, look, yes if money's no. going to be siphoned somewhere, might as well take it and keep it in-house. So we'll tell the production companies that. Uh, <laughs> and, and yes and no is also because then you're, you're, cause then you're also... When is your marketing push? I mean, look at the difference of what happened with Ant-Man and Ultron. We weren't seeing any marketing for Ant-Man at all while Ultron was going on. Right. You know? So what are they going to be marketing? Are they going to be doing a heavy push on, on episode eight? Are they going to be doing a heavy push on Guardians? Like, what's the studio going to push? Is it going to be multiple? Like, what's what's the big budget for marketing? Obviously, they're both going to get big, big marketing pushes, but who's going to get the most? This is why when people like I am all for tradition. I love tradition of Star Wars. You, I, I host a show called Jedi <laughs> Council. If you don't know, so I like Star Wars a little bit. But um, I am actually wishing that they would have had Star Wars take pl- December now. Like create the new season, a new the tradition season of December. In December, they're Wars. doing it with Episode Seven. They're doing it with Rogue One. I understand that they're putting it back in May because it's tradition. But I actually think that it's not only going to snip off of Guardians because it also takes place. The other, the other thing that I wanted to say was that this is also a space opera. Yeah, it's also yep. a, it's also in outer space and another space movie. So there's not necessarily going to be another space movie two weeks later, no matter what. Even Three. If well, I'm saying if you got rid of it, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. like you don't know, know what it was going to compete against. So, but so to have it in December, and I also think that's going to, that's I'll be able to make this point even stronger in the end of December to see what the numbers are like and what Star right. Wars does. Like once, right. because I still think December, January, February, no competition. Episode eight after coming after episode seven, with sequels always do better, right? If the movies are great. So I do think that it's it's tough because summer seasons in general are piling up on one another. I would rather see episode eight in December, but I'm not complaining. We're getting it. We, we, in all seriousness, too, I I like the idea of Star Wars making its annual window in December. Yeah. I, I do like that. And now, if episode seven comes out, let's say it hits 180 or north of 180 opening weekend, then I think you and I in unison are going to be calling out for Disney to just move everything you back to December would, year. You think they would move? Yes. I, episode 8? I think if Episode 7, I don't think they believe, and I don't believe right now, I don't think they believe that Star Wars Episode 7 can crack 170, 180, 190 right. because nothing ever has in right. that month. If it does... I think they're they're smart people, Lucas. I think they'll sit back and go, maybe we need to reevaluate this. If right. we can come close to the two hundred million dollar mark, let's own it. But aren't you taking that away now from the Star Wars fans? Though now that you've told them it's, that you're not, you don't have to wait two years. You, have, you only have to wait a year and a half. Well, I mean, I, I don't. Th- here's the thing, though. And they're filming the, now. Though, yeah, I know they're filming now, but that movie's what 2017, right? That one's 17. Yeah. That yeah. one's 2000. It's two years away. It, it, so it's not like they just pulled a. Um, a G.I. Joe yeah. with The Rock, right? Where it's like two months before yeah. release, they go, oh, we're pushing it back 47 months, everybody. Right. Right. So still a pretty good window. Like, or they do episode eight in May 2017 and, and then readjust start all, the Exactly. Then right. after that, episode, put everything yeah. back right. to December. Yeah. Who knows? What do you think, Clark? Well, Christian, for two people that hate each other as much as you and I do, <laughs> we sure do agree on everything <laughs> when it comes to these release dates. Uh, everything you said is exactly what I think I do. First of all, um, in, terms of, um, in terms of the fact that these are two, you know, uh, they're owned by the same parent company. It's not an accident that their opening dates are there, first of all. And second of all, I was thinking about that too, you know, in terms of the two space operas. When I watched the first Guardians, which I sat next to you, John Campion, right. at the premiere of Guardians, um, when it finished, I was like, that was like, it's like, it is Star Wars. And so, you know, I do wonder, but I, but I don't think that there's going to be, and I guess this is a bad buzzword, but fatigue. I don't think there's going to be fatigue for these things. Right. I think, you know, obviously Guardians and Star Wars are so so different that I don't think the the fans are going to go. Oh, I already saw a space opera 
for this month I'm good. Um, but I do think that you're onto something with December. I think it would be really smart for them to claim stake their claim and not even get into this whole Michigas about the about the Marvel competition competition. It's the same. It all goes into the same bank. So either way, I think uh, yeah, I think we're gonna see. A, I think one of them might move. That would be my prediction. Mm -hmm. All right, folks, that'll do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great movies playing out our friends over at AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and, of course, your movie ticket information. Don't forget, guys, subscribe to this YouTube channel. Click the subscribe button, become a subscriber, be kept up to date on all the videos coming out here, including our new TV recap stuff that's coming that we're really excited about. We want to make sure that you guys are a part of it. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting to my left, Miss Clark Wolf. Clark, where can people find you online? They can find me on the Instagrams and the Twitters at Clark Wolf, Clark with an E, Wolf with an E, and on YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash official Clark Wolf. And I should amend what I literally just said. I think one of them might move based on how Star Wars does this December. Yeah, yeah, I think that's absolutely yeah. that's true. That's what I meant yeah. to say. Okay. Sitting over here, Mr. Christian Harloff. Christian, where can we find you? Twitter and Instagram, at Christian Harloff. And if you haven't watched yesterday's episode of Jedi Council, it was a really good one. We talked about everything, obviously, in the in the movie universe, but we did all the reviews. People were asking if we were going to review Aftermath and talk about Lost Stars. We do all of that. Make sure you check it out. And obviously, hashtag Collider Jedi Council and get your questions on the air next week, which we're going to be on Wednesday next week. Just, just for that week. Though. Just for that week. Yeah, just, just for that, for that week. week. And, of course, our lovely host today, Miss Sinead DeFries. Sinead, where can people find you? I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Sinead DeFries and at that's so Sinead.com. And, of course, you can find me on the various social media networks on Facebook and on Twitter at John Campy. And don't forget, guys, you can book your uh, book it. Huh? You can book your advanced copy of mm -hmm. my new novel coming out, The Pride. Jump on over to Kickstarter, search for The Pride, become one of the supporters of the novel, and get your copy reserved now. Thanks a lot for joining us, guys. That'll do it for us for Collider Video. My name is John Campion. Until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>